Hi there, welcome to the e-commerce nurse podcast, our 30th episode. I'm Karina McLeod, ex-Amazonian and CEO and founder of e-commerce nurse and vendor society. Today, we're going to be talking about why dynamic pricing is the strategy of the future to drive revenue and increase profitability. So we have a special guest, Chad Rubin, CEO and founder of Prophecy, a dynamic pricing platform that enables Amazon brands to predict the perfect price for every product at every precise moment. So that's not only the company that Chad has been found or has founded. So Chad has actually founded or built a number of e-commerce businesses, which have then gone on to being acquired. So I'm super excited to talk to Chad today about pricing, a dynamic pricing, but also about Chad's previous experience and successes as well. So hi, Chad. Thanks for coming on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Grateful. And it, what would be great is I just don't feel the bio does you justice um, in terms of what you're, you know, before you actually founded Prophecy. So do you want to share with our audience a bit about your background, sort of how you got to where you are today? Yeah, for sure. For sure. So started off as an Amazon seller, as a reseller, moved into being a early private label brand on Amazon, probably the first 100 and uh, did very well. And those were the good old days uh, in 2007, eight, nine. This is before there was all these Amazon private label courses that came out and really this gold rush into Amazon. During that time, uh, we were manufacturing vacuum filters, coffee filters, and air filters. We started selling them direct on Amazon. My uh, account manager was a guy named James Thompson <laughs> and uh, would oversee my account. And we formed a really beautiful relationship together. Uh, and I called him up one day and I said, hey, I, he's like, I'm leaving Amazon and I'm going to start something in an agency. And I said, oh, I'm I'm thinking about leaving the product business or migrating and transferring, shifting into a software company called Scubana, which is an inventory software. And he's like, I want to be an advisor. I want to invest. And I was like, that's awesome. So he invested. And then he called me to let me know he was building something called the Prosper Show. And I was like, oh, I want to get involved. I want to. And so I invested, came on the, as one of the co-founders of the company, uh, which eventually got sold to Emerald. And then Stubano was just sold last year. Uh, Stubano is an order management, inventory management system for multi-channel brands and resellers. Uh, that business was sold to 3PL Central. And in the course of selling that company, I dove back into my product business. So my product business is still alive today. It's still functioning on Amazon. We have about 500 SKUs. And like many other people, we are uh, suffering from erosion of profit. And Profit has gotten compressed tremendously over the past years. And I've tried everything. I've tried uh, removing expenses. I've tried advertising more and, and figuring that out. And the one thing I wasn't trying and that I don't see a lot of people trying is a very small lever, but I think small levers swing big doors and that's price. Mm -hmm. So I uh, started building start playing with price and understanding price dynamics on Amazon and realizing that this is a massive opportunity that can be a force multiplier for many brands to maximize profit and started building a data science team around this problem to solve it. Awesome. I love that story. Um, I know James as well. And I, I didn't realize that um, James was actually uh, your account manager during the Amazon days, which really, wow, that's, that's amazing. And that he became part of Scubana and you became part of the Prosper. Um, those are huge. And, and as you say, the different days then, right, in terms of how Amazon was. Um, I always sort of remember the days when I started at Amazon. It was, I think, 2004. Um, advertising didn't exist. You could get away with having no images. You could get away with having one bullet point. And mm -hmm. you could type a keyword in the background and your product would appear on the first page of search results and obviously that uh time has changed so uh, just just hearing your story you've clearly got huge amounts of years experience in in this industry and the pricing part seems to be a really interesting part as you say because profitability is becoming harder harder with amazon um 
prices are going up, but just in a general economy right right now as well. And so you talk about also this dynamic pricing um, and we spoke about it when we last caught up and it got me thinking and it got me started. And I started to research dynamic pricing because I was like, right, I need to need to understand this. This is an interesting topic. Can you share with our audience a bit more about what we mean by dynamic pricing? Yeah. So, you know, businesses have been using yeah. it for some time. So first of all, like power players like Amazon, Expedia, Uber, global hedge funds have been using dynamic pricing to optimize every penny of profit. Amazon, for example, changes pricing two and a half million times a day. Wow. And so the problem is that like Amazon brands that are on the marketplace, private label brands have not had this opportunity to have that same power and prophecy, the company that I just started, is giving them that that superpower. Mm -hmm. So on Amazon, like in the old days, right, you would go and you'd be a reseller and everyone was competing for the buy box and there's no shortage of uh, reseller buy box software out there. Mm -hmm. But the difference is that when you're optimizing for, not for the buy box, but you're optimizing for the search engine ranking page on Amazon on page one, how do you know that you're maximizing, you're optimizing your, your price to maximize profit? Mm -hmm. nobody knows like if you type in garlic press you have a garlic press for 10.99 for 12.99 for 18.99 and like those garlic presses on a monthly basis are selling let's just say on page one uh, position one they're selling 10,000 units that's if you increase price by a dollar that's another ten thousand dollars of profit and so the question is how do you maximize profit at a given time of the day at the very precise moment to not sacrifice bsr and that's really what we've been focusing our time on. So Amazon shoppers, as you know, right, they leave behind clues of their behaviors, their preferences, their searches. On top of that, you have your competitors who are competing for you on keywords, and they have a different price. They have different reviews. There's so many external factors to understand when you're pricing a product. And so we are analyzing these factors in real time with machine mm -hmm. learning, with statistical science, with behavioral economics to pinpoint the optimal price. And again, the premise is to maximize profit. So it could be that you're pricing it too low, in which we would increase your price, or your mm -hmm. price too high, we lower it, it would increase your BSR and also maximize your absolute profit dollars at the, at the end of the day. Wow, that's awesome. Awesome, because People always think, assume that it uh, can be the race to the bottom, right? That's how Amazon has been in the past. Of let's just drop price in order to win the buy box, which is just not sustainable either. And and when I when I started to read about dynamic pricing, I, I read that airlines and that have been doing it for quite some time. And I think it was actually a blog article that you wrote. Um, how uh, different companies have been using it, and and as you mentioned, Expedia as well that. It's out there really, because I always find that when you go to buy a ticket, the price keeps changing. And then you think, leave it alone because I, I might be increasing the price because I'm showing this demand, right? Yeah, I mean, look, there's tons of arbitrage opportunity to be had. And that's really what I'm exposing with the software is that you can just small, small changes in price can be amazing for your mm -hmm. profit at the end of the day. And so, like, like you said, Expedia has been doing this for a while. The question is, like, why haven't other e-commerce companies or brands, why aren't they doing this? The reason why I'm focusing on Amazon is that Amazon is like a, market, like a financial market. Mm -hmm. And it's a basket of goods, a basket of widgets, no different than the stock market. And those that fluctuate, and everyone's uh, very comfortable with the fluctuations of Amazon. Everyone knows that price changes. It's sort of a given. Mm -hmm. And so that's really where I see there to be a massive opportunity. The beta cohort that we've been working with so far, we've been working with some pretty large companies and they're right now seeing on average roughly 10 to 12% increase of profit on a monthly basis by using prophecy. So I'm like, wow. I'm humbled by the results. I'm like amazed by it. And this is yep. just the beginning of our model that we've been building for the past, it's, well, I guess it's coming up on eight months. Awesome. Because really the truth is there's so much guesswork in setting that price in the first instance. It's based on just a, a certain threshold that needs to be achieved. But actually there's no real science beyond that that goes goes into it. So 
that's that's really interesting and fantastic yeah. results and you mentioned earlier about repricing tools do you in your eyes is that kind of becoming a thing of the past i think I, it's funny <laughs> I, I developed all these stickers and fun stuff i mean you see on the site it says like leave those old repricers behind yeah and the, the problem in software and i think in just technology in general is that like, if you don't innovate somebody else is going to out innovate you Mm -hmm. And like if Apple start, stopped innovating with the first iPhone, then there would have been a different incumbent that owns that space right now. Mm -hmm. And so now they have the iPhone 10, 12, whatever number they're at now, 14, whatever they're at. And so I think that just there's been lack of innovation because they've been riding off the profits of what they've had. And so for me, I just, I like focusing on hard problems, beautiful problems that need to be solved and ones that nobody is focusing on. And just now, as I've built this, as I've announced it, I see now copycats, like now repricers are suddenly moving into my direction. But the problem is, is that they're always going to be, like, they don't know the mechanics of what I'm building. Mm -hmm. They don't know the reason of why I'm building it. They don't know really any, anything about what I'm building. So they're, they're just merely always going to be following in my footsteps. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, they've already changed their website headline to say, we optimize for profit. And it's like, no, you don't. No, not, but it's just, and I think the other difference is like AI and data science in general is thrown around very loosely, right? Mm -hmm. Every website in the Amazon software tool stack says we are AI, we are data science. Yeah. And um, it's just a lot of hype and it's, it's, I think it's problematic when you're really truly building a foundational mm -hmm. business in data science because people then it just ruins it for everybody else because like I'm, I built a whole team around data science I'm spending, I'm capital investing a lot of money into this space. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so um, yes, I, I think that they're going to try to maybe be where I'm at, but it's just weak logic that masquerades as AI versus like we are truly building AI and, and really what AI, yeah, yeah. And what AI is, is it, it's a, it's just like when you go on Instagram or Facebook, mm -hmm. It, there's no one behind the scenes. It's like hitting a button. I oh, oh sh show Karina this, right? Show them, show her this story on Instagram or Facebook. They're learning from your behavior and mm -hmm. they're adjusting what they're showing you based on your behavior. Yeah. And they're doing it at scale. And on top of that, the model learns from itself. Yeah. So it reinforces itself through what it's seeing in the real world. And that's exactly what prophecy is doing on Amazon with all the cues and all the behaviors that we're pulling into the model. Wow. And that whole behavior thing though is, is pretty crazy when you've just looked at one thing and then all of a sudden you're being spat, you just feel that you are being watched, right? It's uh, it is really crazy. And, and you're right. AI is thrown around a lot. It's definitely thrown around a lot in the advertising space as well, as in these tools are AI, but there's still, it's still not 100% percent there i guess that's really complementative in terms of the fact that you're always going to get copycats right um but that as you say that can create uh sometimes the wrong noise as you say in terms of you're creating this tool about profitability but is it really um you're actually investing in it and and so you mentioned about the investing and you're you're bringing up lots of capital this this part really interests me as in it's not I guess it's not a it's not an easy project, right? To be launching a tool where you do require this data um, analyst, this team of um, you know, it's huge data science behind it all. How do you go around sort of building a company? You've got your idea, but there's a huge amount of capital needed to to really get that idea off the ground. So you're saying, how do I raise money? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think I've developed, I wasn't always good at raising capital. And I think it's an art and a science simultaneously. And when I raised money for Scubana in 20, I want to say 2014, I made a list of the top 10 people I want to in involve in the business. And one mm -hmm. of those people was James Thompson. And uh, another person was a guy named Brian Lee. So I made a list of like really the most important people who would like, it would be like a stamp of approval on this platform. And, um, you know, it's, most of them didn't write back. Mm -hmm. Most of them were like, no, we're not investing. And uh, you just need one or two. So 
Brian Lee, who started Lidl Zoom and Shoe Dazzle, Art of Sports with Kobe Bryant. He, he ended up actually investing very early. It was one of his earliest investments that he made in a new VC fund he started. And um, that really got us going, right? Like if I told people oh, Brian Lee invested, then like other people wanted to invest. <laughs> yeah. So it was a combination of like, I created a, a really nice deck, a very thoughtful deck. I spent a lot of time building the deck and my thoughts around the landscape, the competitive landscape and the problem that we're solving. Mm -hmm. And then I started just cold messaging people for that uh, to invest. And a lot of friends and family did. And I was lucky enough to have the same investor from Stubana that did our series A. They put in 5.4 into the business in 2019. We sold in 21. They came in for a two-peat to invest in Prophecy um, as our only investor. So I didn't have to go to friends or family or I didn't have to look far because I have that relationship now. Wow, that's, that's, that's amazing. How does it fit? I mean, you're going after lots of different people. And as you say, some people just don't respond or people say no. How do you keep that drive and that motivation, right? Because yeah. you take a few knocks on the chin, you know, and you've got to keep, keep that motivation to keep going. First of all, it's a lot of knocks on the chin. <laughs> uh, it's not a few. Yeah. And um, I one of the things I did, I, I can tell you with Stubana, I reached out to a lot of people mm. to invest in that business. And um, the no's, I essentially compiled into a massive PDF document. Mm -hmm. And I have that document. I mean, you can put it on your wall, you can do different things to inspire you, but just like compiling all the no's to like go back and reflect on all the no's that you've received. I think that helps helps uh give you like an impetus of something to strive forward to like especially if you really believe in what you're building mm -hmm. so that's that's one way to yeah. to to uh to stay focused and yeah i mean I, I think there's a lot of mistakes in the journey too but i think the mistakes are teaching moments that make you stronger mm -hmm. So okay. I'm now using a lot of the mistakes I've made in all these other previous companies as a framework to help me make sense of the past and to not make those same mistakes going forward. Mm -hmm. Because now I know what happened. I can learn differently, differently from them and try to focus on not making that same mistake in this new entity. I love that because it's a positive spin, right? And I, I love that you've actually got those those no's, a list of who who said uh, who said no. I remember that um, for for future reference. But also, as you say, using those mistakes and and turning it around into a positive and something that you you learn from. And it's keeping striving to go continue going forward um, as well. Because some people can get really knocked, um, but clearly that hasn't been one of you one of those. And the fact that you've been able to get investment straight away and move forward with prophecy immediately is is fantastic yeah it's pretty cool and i by the way i did take a break i took mm -hmm. some time in between so i sold scubana in april i resigned in october and then started prophecy in december uh <laughs> i guess i can't sit still but during this time i actually hired a lot of personal coaches and did a lot of self-reflection and development on myself to come out and to pave the way for this next thing that I'm that's going to consume a lot of my focus and energy to make it great and to mm -hmm. lead from a different place awesome so do you think that if you were starting up again like your previous companies before you would have done I, I'm guessing a lot of things differently and just you as a person in general have are seeing things differently as well yeah I mean I'm definitely much more mature I've <laughs> professionalized over the years and um, you now have a child, which also shifts a lot for you as a, yeah. as a human being and your focus and priorities. But yeah, I would have done a lot, a lot of things differently, but those mistakes make a lot of that, a lot of those painful mistakes make you who you are. Yeah, completely. Definitely, definitely, definitely change, changes things. So I know we're slightly going off topic and, and going on pricing, but I, I'm just sort of really 
really intrigued by your by your story and it all sort of interlinks into sort of where you are today and we spoke about pricing and and you've still got your other business so do you use the other business that you have to almost uh is your guinea pig in terms of trialing your prophecy and all your sort of ideas that you have yeah yeah it's it's the word on the street for that is called dog fooding so we eat our own dog food so essentially crucial which is my e-com company we find these problems we mm-hmm. have these like oh shit moments where you yep. stub your toe and you're like what is this why does this have to be this bad and we start trying to develop problems solutions around those problems mm-hmm. but yeah precisely that i mean it's gotten pretty pretty it's gotten hit hard uh, in the past couple of years with more competition, with rising raw material costs, increased PPC costs, mm-hmm. uh, supply chain bottlenecks, uh, la- scarce labor in our warehouse mm-hmm. to hire for. And so all of that has created like this perfect storm, which means that you got to get a lot more creative on other parts of the business and do things that other people aren't doing. And I think one of those things, it really is like algorithmic pricing yeah yeah definitely and, and with this then algorithm i can even uh tongue it's almost tongue-tied there algorithmic pricing um do you think that that could then take the lead into bricks and mortar because bricks and mortar is like it's evolving still everyone was like oh the days of bricks and mortar are over and then amazon starts changing things in the store do you think that that could then take a step from online and move over to bricks and mortar? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Hmm. It's going to re- require like a change in behavior. And I don't know if necessarily people are going to like changing prices when they're in the store and ha- the frequency of those changing of prices. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I'm, I'm unsure about that model. Yeah. Yeah. But I do yeah. know that the model that we're building with Prophecy Online it's not only timely, but it's not necessarily new for online when you're making purchases. Yeah. So I think that mitigates and eliminates a lot of the risk mm-hmm. associated with it. Yeah, definitely. And how does how would do you see dynamic pricing working when it comes to sort of promotional activity? Or do you think that's it? Are promotions really needed if you've then got dynamic pricing uh, taking the lead? So I think the next step for us in our model, so like we're, we're, we're building lots of different factors and variables into the model, right? Mm-hmm. And the reason why it works is that it's very hard for one person to actually analyze all these factors in real time to do it and to create superior results. And by the time you, you've analyzed all those things, the market has changed as your, your competitors are reacting, right? You're, in a, you're not mm-hmm. in a vacuum. You're, di- you're, you're in a community of other sellers. You're in a market. Yeah. So um i forgot where i was going with that but uh yeah i think that oh so we've done a present uh, promotions right so mm-hmm. right now we've got a lot of these factors and we can add other factors and one of those factors is the coupons piece yeah and amazon's rolling out all types of stuff right like you've not mm-hmm. only have like the seller choice badge uh the best seller badge right how does that affect your pricing power as a mm. brand and then you can think about, well, okay, when you get the badge where Amazon now says the lowest price in 30 days. So like there's, they're constantly evolving and changing. Mm. We have to constantly keep up. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's an interesting point. And, and even, uh, and this just may be, we've been in the industry for so long uh, with Amazon Prime, but it didn't feel that Amazon Prime was as hyped as it has been for previous years have you seen anything anything differently uh, when you say prime you're talking about um, prime, day, prime day yeah. prime day yeah i mean it's the same it's pretty much i mean i saw a lot of it i was paying close attention i was seeing a lot of the same brands mm. advertising on amazon and a lot of the customers and brands that we've i've been talking to were sitting this one out right mm. because you can't there's only so much you can squeeze yeah right? so there's like nothing left for the brand and so lots of brands are like, you know what? I don't need to play this game. I'm going to play mm-hmm. a different game. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the key, though, is having the data at your fingertips. So I, it's kind of like this, right? If you, 
I mean, you're in England, so like Tesla, right? I don't mm-hmm. know if Teslas are really widely used there. Yeah, we've got we've got some Teslas. Not crazy, but it's definitely growing. Yeah. So if you're getting behind the wheel of a Tesla and mm-hmm. you're planning a road trip, yeah, and the road the, the road is open to you and you can do some things yourself in your car, like yep. turn on the air conditioner, or you can actually delegate some of those tasks to the car, which by the way, the, the Tesla can do better than you can mm-hmm. to help you drive with more confidence. And that's exactly what we're building with Prophecy, mm-hmm. right? Like some things you can do yourself, you, you can probably source better. You, you can't automate your sourcing and your, your relationship mm-hmm. with your vendor in China. Yeah, but you can absolutely make a whole lot more money by optimizing for your pro- your price, which, mm-hmm. which leads to your profit. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and the comment that you made about earlier about some people just sort of staying out of it because there's only a certain amount you can you can basically drop down to. We um we have a e-commerce nurse. We have a, another business vendor society, vendor society, and basically it's a global community of Amazon vendors. And we have virtual roundtables and different events. And on the roundtables, we're talking about promotion and pricing. Being that was one recent topic, and a lot of people are staying out of it because it's like there's no much more. There's no more money in the pot to give away for promotions. And that's okay from a, okay, you sold X amount of products, but actually it comes down to the bottom line. You're not there to just make sales. You're there to actually get profit. And if you're not getting the profit, there's no point in dropping, you know, keep dropping the price um, just for, for the sale. Um, and we're definitely seeing that. And I guess the question also is coming as in how sustainable is PPC? Um, how sustainable? is Amazon advertising for businesses from a, from a profitability point of view. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? So, I mean, I certainly have felt the inflation of ad spend mm. and, and the competitive nature of it, and it just keeps on going up. So yeah. I'm, I'm trying to stabilize, but a lot of, there's a lot of like ad softwares out there. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them are doing bid management to help you bid more efficiently. And for prophecy, like my focus is not really on efficiency. It's more on effectiveness. Yeah. So if I, if I can give you 10% more profit on a monthly basis, that's me being effective. Now let's mm-hmm. put PPC into it. So let me see if I take this bottle and let's say I'm selling this bottle on Amazon for 10 bucks. Yep. So I'm selling this for 10. My cost of acquisition is a dollar. Yeah. So a dollar for 10, that's a 10% ACOS, right? But now suddenly, if I now know that I increased my price by $2, let's just say it mm-hmm. goes to 10, 10 to 12. Now my ACOS goes from 10% to 8.3%. Mm-hmm. And which means my return on ad spend is 12X versus 10X. Yeah. These kinds of, these aren't small things, but these are things that for me, pricing and advertising go together, which is why I'm talking to a lot of advertising agencies and companies out there and software companies, because it's like peanut butter and jelly. Mm-hmm. The, the return on ad spend formula is including price. You can't, yeah. talk, you can't talk about like ads without talking about price. And the problem is that it's been very siloed in our industry for a very long time where everyone just talks about ACOS <laughs> and just leaves leaves price over there just like that's not something that we can focus on but that's absolutely something we can focus on yeah yeah definitely and and you're right the you know everybody does focus on the ACOS and doesn't you know complains about ACOS being too high and it's like well increase our conversations well have you done your competitor analysis have you reviewed why do you why are you at that price do you really need to be at that price etc etc but again all of that is not using AI, right? That's not using data science. That's somebody going in and manually going, oh, well, this person is selling it for this and using some tools that give them that information. But a lot of it is guesswork. And if you're looking at a competitor over, um, on Tuesday and then the competitor drops their price on Wednesday, the work that you've done is completely redundant anyway, right? Not to mention that you'd have to track your BSR, you'd have to track your sessions, your conversion rate, your revenue on the product, your profit on the product. Then you have to track your ad spend on a specific campaign as it relates to the product. I mean, we're talking about an insane amount of inputs that you have to actually analyze to come up with what the proper price is. And by the time you do that, let's just say it takes you 30 days to figure it out or two mm-hmm. months to figure it out. 
that price has already expired. All the, all the data has already changed. Yeah. yeah. Everything, conversion, sessions, ad spend, everything. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And would you say this is more relevant because of the work that you're doing is, is particularly on Amazon, more for businesses that sell solely on one channel uh, as opposed to selling on multiple multiple channels? Yeah, I mean, we're focusing on Amazon brands that are native on Amazon. Although there's a customer in our beta cohort, they are 90% Amazon, 10% Shopify. Mm, it's a very yeah. sizable business. We give them an export of the prices and they upload them to, to Shopify. So inside of our software, we actually have built uh, suppression management mm -hmm. into it. So we can actually detect when suppression happens, if there is suppression, because Amazon doesn't like it when you change pricing and it's not in their best interest. Right? Yeah. And pricing is different. If it's not a parity with Amazon, you have Target, Shopify, and Amazon. Mm -hmm. Amazon kind of like slaps you on the wrist. So we built in management around that. And our software has a export that you can upload into Shopify. But over time on our roadmap, we're going to be developing more functions and features to make it more multi-channel focused. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Because I could see just overall, um, and the question being, is dynamic pricing the strategy of the future completely? Um, and so it's usually if it happens on Amazon, it will end up happening everywhere else. And uh, I guess other channels like Walmart um, being a, an evolving marketplace as well. Although I'm not sure how, how dynamic pricing would work with those guys. Yeah, I mean, we just have to develop different models. Right? So there's so many directions we can go in with what we're building right now. Right now, we're just trying to do one thing and do it extremely well. Yeah. And that yeah. is Amazon maximize profit. So yeah. we can develop other models. We can either go to other channels as well. And these are all just like places we can go into the future, which to me just allows me to ascertain that there's massive opportunity. Completely. The, um, I mean, when I asked that question about bricks and mortar, I already thought about the day I went into an Amazon, for, um, an Amazon store and they've already computerized the pricing. So they can actually start playing around mm. with pricing as well compared to any other store that's got the POS that they'd have to actually change. You'd have to have someone changing the tag every, every yeah. minute. Um, and then I thought, well, isn't that the future of stores having stores where dig it's all digital price tagging in the, in the stores, you know, to allow for that um, rather than yeah, having think, to create that price. Yeah. I think that, I think that's a really cool concept. It's kind of like gas prices, right? You go yeah. and you see on the, the board, it's digital. It's, it's, it's never fixed. It's always changing. And the costs, I mean, I think e-commerce more than other industries right now have experienced the change in costs and the rapid mm -hmm. inflation of costs. Uh, across their entire business and like there's no need why they just have to have that if we want to relate it back to the retail store that card that you have to swap out each time like that's kind of what's happening is that an amazon brand is just statically pricing their product yeah and then on you go online and i see these like i guess you want to call them gurus or circuit speakers that are keynoters and they're like just telling people to raise price <laughs> but they don't know the implication of that Mm -hmm. They don't know if actually raising price is the right decision. Maybe actually lowering price is the right decision because that increases your BSR and it also generates the velocity offsets the price decrease where you're generating more absolute profit dollars. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just, it's all, it should, also be, should be driven based on data. There shouldn't be just like one app waxing, hey, everyone raise your price. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like you say, uh, it's about finding that sweet spot, isn't it? Um, you know, everybody says, oh, well, you've got to be competitive to sell, drop your price. Oh, you need to be profitable, increase your price. Like it's it's kind of that simple. And it reminds me of, um, I remember during my Amazon days, we did this exercise on, I think I mentioned it to you in the past on price elasticity, just mm -hmm. from um, a promotional standpoint, because years ago, the days when I worked at Amazon, it was just about revenue the prof profit didn't really exist in in those days because i launched in new uh, launched new product categories into the um, uk market so it was just about awareness revenue but then what we were finding was actually we were discounting products way too much more than we needed to and we were trying to figure out whether 10 percent gets any attention um how much what about if we do 20 percent? and then we were trying to do different levels and sometimes you think that waving the 50% off flag is great. Actually, 
20, 25, I think it was 25, 30% was almost just as successful. And then mm -hmm. when it came actually to waving the 60 to 70% flag, it actually dropped because people were like, yeah, I don't believe you. I think you just played around. And that was when sellers were playing around with the RRP or the MSRP to make it out like, the, you know, uh, and nobody, you know, then there was this trust part as in, well, if it's 70% off, I reckon there's a problem with the product, right, mm. <laughs> uh, as well. So I remember, yeah, those days, and I found it quite interesting that it actually highlighted that you didn't need to discount products as much as you thought. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point around the perception of value. Mm -hmm. I know that, like, for example, I was recently, so I'm on this wellness resort right now with my family. I, I think I shared with you before we jumped on the podcast. And it's a wonderful place called Serenby, uh, like Serenity and to be together called Serenby. And we, you know, we've been acquiring more things for like my son, like a, a toy here or a toy there, this stuff adds up. And I'm like, wow, we won't be able to fit this in my car. Okay, mm -hmm. so what do I need to do? I need to go on Amazon, I need to buy a car roof rack, like a cargo rack for my car. So I go on Amazon, I start looking at all the photos and doing shopping and I see something for 60 bucks, but then I see something for 120 bucks. And of course, mentally I'm thinking, well, given again, all these factors you need to like compute in your head, mm -hmm. given the reviews, the quality of the reviews and the recency of the reviews, I mean, go look at these. Okay. Well, there's a reason why this is 120 and this one is 60 and end up buying actually a $160 car cargo roof rack for my car. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. And then sometimes what you find out is it's probably from the same factory <laughs> as a cheat, you know, but it is, it is all about perception. But I guess when you start doing dynamic pricing, there isn't that was or now that or it comes down to that question about promotions. You, you, you haven't really got anything to compare with because it is really what that price is at that point in time, as you say, real time. It's real time, but you're comparing well, first of all, the model already has your whole past in mm -hmm. the model. So it knows your past. It yeah. knows the present and it also knows your competitors and it knows all these other factors. So all of this is being flowing in like it's making these, these decisions on demand. Mm -hmm. Like I shared earlier, that example with Instagram or Facebook, right? Like it's, it's, it's the all-knowing source of truth. Yeah. And making the absolute best decision based on the scientific empirical evidence that it has to process or to change your price upwards or downwards based on all the input that's gathering yeah yeah definitely definitely and this is all really really interesting and, and as i say it starts taking my uh i start thinking about sort of the world of uh because i just love the world of retail as well and, and my my i was sort of started in bricks and mortar so i moved over to the online world so i always sort of love seeing how the dynamics change between between the two um, if you just, um, if there was anybody starting to think or uh, rethink their pricing strategy or review it, what would your, what would your key tip be? The key tip to rethink your pricing. Well, if you haven't changed pricing, you should really consider changing it. Mm -hmm. And then the question then is, is, well, what do you change it to? Yeah. So, you know, you can talk to me. I'm, I'm always available to chat about this kind of stuff. I'm geeking out on this all day long. <laughs> uh, but like, I would probably take a look at your conversion rate, your sessions, your spend, your competitors, your top five competitors for your, your hero keywords that, you're, that mm -hmm. you're bidding for and that you're ranking for and start creating like a pretty massive spreadsheet of all these variables and analyzing them and then start making tweaks and changes to pricing to see what happens. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And actually, I have one last question for, for, for you. Given the tool that you're creating, how do you figure out your pricing when you're selling to your customers? Do you have any sort of customer behavior or kind of data science behind that? Because if you think about it, we're both like in a service industry and pricing, trying to find that sweet spot for us as a business in that service in industry is a challenge, right? And it's because a lot of that isn't, we don't see what our competitors are, for example, as an agency. So do you use any magic science behind your pricing? Well, firstly, if you're not looking at your competitors, I think you should be. I'm a yeah. big fan of, of really uh, secret shopping. 
mm-hmm. <laughs> for lack of a better word. Yeah. Because like you got to know what's out there, right? Yeah. Like you can't just like create a product and sell it without knowing what else is out there. What are the flaws? What's great? And there's a lot that you can learn and glean from those conversations. Uh, for my own pricing, you know, we, I think like software pricing in general and everyone's pricing is a moving target, right? Like mm-hmm. I'm sure e-commerce nurse, the price that you had a year ago or two years ago, I would assume I'm making a big assumption right now, but I'm assuming that it's changed over time. Completely. Okay. And so the same for me with Stubana. In fact, Mm -hmm. for Stubana, our first client paid $8. Wow. And she disputed the bill. Oh, so and like, and we, we, we literally, I mean, like our our pricing is scaled much more than that, uh, even upon the sale and prophecy, our pricing is just, you know, for us, I'm really focusing right now on delivering value. Mm-hmm. to our merchants and brands. Yeah. So I'm just focused on creating value for others. And I know that we'll be rewarded for it. So like right now I'm giving a lot of the customers that are in our beta cohort, a pretty large uh, discount to give us feedback, but also in return for that, we help them flourish. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And that's a different type of value, right? That's actually really great value for both in terms of getting that discount but that feedback is invaluable when you're building up a business so that is awesome thank you so much chad for sharing all of this i could talk to you about many a different topics i wanted to try and keep it on the pricing subject but i know that you've um as i said at the start you've um worked in many a different areas and had some successes in everything and uh, a couple of things that you've um, mentioned today will definitely stick in my my mind as well um the the one thing of the nose I think is absolutely uh, excellent and just sort of how you how you use things that have gone on in in the past to to create that tool but more so how you're thinking about users and what's valuable to them um, as well which is great so if any of our listeners are listening and thinking right this is this is that that magic formula that's going to help me get more profit because I'm guessing there are a lot of businesses out there that are struggling or and it, this is just the start. What do they need to do to be able to find out more about uh, Prophecy? Yeah, they can go to prophecy.com, P-R-O-F-A-S-E-E.com. Uh, they can reach out to me, chat at prophecy.com. I'm happy to help if they have any questions, but definitely request access because we have at least right now about 100 beta customers on the wait list. And so we're accepting, we're kind of rolling admissions into the beta program. And as we scale, we have to launch more, but please apply because you'll get priority spot slotted in our beta. Awesome. And a question, are you working with agencies as well? Yeah, agencies and aggregators. So reach out to me and we can make it happen. We built it for actually for aggregators and agencies in mind. You can toggle on the left between different organizations so that essentially agencies can sell this to their clients and help Mm -hmm. them make be more profitable. Awesome. Anything to help clients, which is which is at the end of the day what we're what we're there for. So awesome. Thanks again, Chad, for being an awesome yeah. guest today. Thank for you sharing so much. Your insights. All right. Yeah. Take care. Thank you.